Welcome back to another episode of Shifting Schools. I'm Jeff Udick, and I'm here all by myself today as Trisha is off covering another podcast as we're trying to uh, get a bunch of podcasts in the can here in this month so that we've got some time coming up. We both have a bunch of travel ahead and some consultancies coming up, so we're trying to get ahead of the game and we're splitting them up. But you'll see us both back together uh, very soon. But man, am I excited to bring you today's guest, Sherard Shakiz Duvall, who was born in Ridgewood, North Carolina, or sorry, South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. This guy has been a powerhouse in the world of hip hop and media literacy. At the age of eight, he penned his first script, A Journey of a Stamp, mind you, providing that creativity knows no bounds. But it was the beats of hip hop introduced to him through a hand-me-down Fisher Price record player and a 45 of LL Cool J that has set his solos on fire. He exploded onto the scenes as Shaquille's DJing across the East Coast and even making it to a BET and MTV. Fast forward to college and he starts a gaming channel, two-hour hip-hop radio show, nonstop hip-hop at WUSC 90.5 FM, eventually turning into a thriving event, a live event series. Currently, though, he is the mastermind and founder behind On The Real Media Group. That's OTR Media Group. I can't wait to dig into this fascinating journey and just talking to Sherard today about the idea of screens. And a couple things I want you to listen for in today's, and I'm going to read these from my notes here real quick, but he just dropped some amazing knowledge for me. Uh, the first thing he talks about, the language of the screen. Screen language. How great is that? We talk about media literacy. We talk about uh, information literacy, but that the actual language of a screen, and Shrag gets into that today as well. He also has this great quote I want you to listen for where he says, media literacy is self-defense. Think about that for a second, folks. Media literacy is self-defense defense. And uh, we're going to get all into this today about media literacy, about the power of storytelling, about the power of having students be creators rather than consumers on their devices. I'm so excited for you uh, to be able to listen to this with Sherar Duvall. So buckle up, folks, because this conversation is going to be one for the books. I'm excited to turn you over to Sherard. And with that, on with the show. Welcome to the Shifting Schools podcast. I'm here with Sherard Shakiz Duvall. Nice to have you on the podcast today, sir. Thank you for having me, Jeff. I really appreciate it. It was awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. We're going to jump right in with our questions. Uh, today, your work focuses on media literacy education, something we're huge fans of over here at Shifting Schools, too, Good. and nonfiction storytelling. As an artist, you work started in a different medium, DJing, which is kind of cool. How has working across these different mediums helped you as a storyteller? You know what? That's such a great question to start with because in my, you know, in my music world, music part, everybody has multiple parts of themselves, right? Sure. Which is which is where the Shakis comes from in my name. Shakis the Beast was my DJ name when I was a DJ okay. for a, a, a long time on radio and then I did some TV stuff and um, I still DJ. DJ and hip hop is a big part of my heart. And DJing for me was always about storytelling. You know, I was kind of trained more in the old school world of DJing where, you know, we love performing for a crowd. And I remember mm -hmm. very early on some of my earliest um, mentors uh, like uh, uh, DJ Shaq Kim and, and, and DJ uh, and people like uh, Vern Large here in South Carolina, they would tell me, you know, it was like shaping up. You know, you're taking people on a journey. You know, mm. when you're DJing for them live, you know, and that journey is like a story arc, right? You have your beginning and then you have your rising action and then you have your climax and then your falling action is the end, right? When you get to the to the resolution. And that was kind of my claim to fame as a DJ was programming and okay. understand and taking people on that arc, you know, never playing the same second records twice, whether I was doing a, 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 
college party or whether I was doing something for BET or whether I was doing something for uh, a, a wedding. It didn't really matter. It was the same cool. thing. And I was well known for that. And so understanding the way story works and the way story arc works and the way their story uh, connects to people is something I've been doing for a long time. And it's so interesting to me because I started um, my journey into film Around the same time, I was kind of like at the height of my DJ career. I, I, I went to the University of South Carolina. As, as I'm a media arts major there. I came out in 2001, and that was at the time when I was on radio and was doing making appearances okay. on BET Rap City and stuff like that. And uh, uh, so, at so I, as I shifted into the film industry, you know, it's interesting, Jeff. Um, when you're first going into a career. You, when you're younger, you think that you have to separate. You know, you have mm. to create these compartments, right? You know, there's the there's the Jeff that people know, your family know, your friend knows, and then there's the Jeff that's the corporate, right? Jeff. Yeah. And that's kind of how I was for a while because I was like, I got to make up my name separate from what I was doing on radio, and so I want everybody yeah. to call me Sherard. And but then <laughs> as I got into uh, um, doing more stuff like VH1 and, and MTV and ESPN. And then I started working in the documentary world around 2013, 2014. I was like, oh, like the way that I felt about story as a DJ works the same way in this mm. world. Like uh, it, it really is a journey. And that journey has what I call human connective tissue, if that makes sense. Mm. Like there's certain things about stories. It doesn't matter your gender or race or religion or what part of the country that you're from. You know, if you can connect to that tissue that makes someone go, oh, I could, that sounds like my mom or I know a friend that went through that or man, I can really, that reminds me of something I went through with my wife. Um, it's the same human connective tissue you have with a complete stranger when you're at a show or a party, right? You know, y'all yeah. are singing the song together. You've never met this person ever in your life. Yeah. They're feeling great. You're feeling great. <laughs> and y'all are sharing this moment together, right? I love that. It works the same way in film. You know, it's all about uh, really getting to the heart of the story. And that's that, what I call, uh, what we call here, and I, I call human connective tissue that that bonds you no matter your who you are. And uh, yeah, so yeah, to me, so to me, it's kind of a, a piece of the same uh, uh, fabric. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, and you know, storytelling is storytelling. I love that. Mm -hmm. Once you kind of find out how it works for you, the median it does go across medians a lot. Oh, yeah. Well, I really want to dig into. Uh, you are the founder of OTR, which is on the real. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe talk a little bit about uh, that adventure? And we're going to dig into that a little bit here. Yeah. So OTR came about. Um, when I got, so, so full disclosure, I, I left the, uh, music industry around 2009, 2010 or so full because, because my film career was really taking off and a big part of me leaving was I didn't like the kind of, um, the way people were treated in the music mm. industry. It, it just was very, you know, it was like you're walking around in the fog all the time. You don't know who is really can do what they say they can do. A lot of people are, are, are pitting on airs or lying to people. So I, I just got tired of dealing in that environment. And I went over more into the, what I call the corporate film environment, working more with folks like Discovery Health and Discovery Channel, and ESPN. And I found a lot of those same attitudes in that world. And I was like, mm. you know, I love this work. I want to be a part of this work, but the people, I don't like the people that much. <laughs> and I took a position with um, the Nickelodeon Theater here in Columbia, South Carolina. It's an art house theater. Mm. And they were starting a, a, a film education and media literacy uh uh, uh, arm department and they were building a building and they were having this initiative and they were like they, the executive director at the time came to me and was like hey we really want to film a TV producer to run this we don't know that many in town we certainly don't that, know that many in South Carolina that are black you know yeah. and I was like no I, I actually do produce for TV and film I'm not a teacher like I don't have no interest in it <laughs> and so he was just on me for probably about three months about doing it and then when I got into the world um if you know anything about the art house cinema world, they're really heavy on documentary. And so that's what introduced me into the world of documentary work. And so mm. it was at that time where I said, oh, wait a minute, 
I can take a strength of mine from the film world, which was I, I, I did mostly the, what, what you would call well, reality TV or 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 uh, um, um, storytelling that was documentary based. But in the in the network world, we're always packaging it. So it's not necessarily scripted, but it's definitely scripted. And yeah. so that was kind of already a part of what I was doing. And so I was trying to think of ways because I was coming from the hip hop world where I could kind of, you know, I, I wanted to infuse that part of me into what we were doing with the with the uh what we were going to be doing as a company as, as i was thinking about going out on my own and that's how on the real came about on the real um is a hip-hop term that just means authenticity it means okay. just honest and raw and that's kind of what i was known for in the film world was documentary you know real honest raw you know not narrative really docs so up really getting to the heart of a story and i was like oh okay uh on the real that that really needs to be the name of the company and so um that's how otr came about you know and we launched it maybe about 2015 we rebranded it was originally otr films which we still have Mm -hmm. OTR Films is the house where we do all of our feature film work, and then OTR Media Group is everything else, and so everything falls under that umbrella. So yeah, that's how awesome. it came about. Awesome. Talk a little bit about, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about how OTR connects with schools and some of the work you're doing. Uh, yes. So uh, going back to my time at the Nickelodeon Theater, I was, I was a director, I was their first director of media education there, and so I was responsible for developing their media education programs. And I had a chance to visit uh, the Jacob Burns Film Center in Pleasantville, mm -hmm. New York. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a gentleman by the name of Stephen Atkin. Uh, he wrote this book called The Age of Screams. And the work they were doing around media literacy work was n like nothing I had ever seen before mm -hmm. because they were approaching it from the standpoint of um, teaching the screen as a language, if that makes sense, screen, screen mm -hmm. language. Right? I love that. And so understanding how to process screen information, you have to learn the language that we use for screen. And what I found mm -hmm. so fascinating about that, and I don't even know if this was Andy, who was the executive director of Nick at the time. I don't know if that was his intention, but I immediately began to see the connection between my work and the ed education work then. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. You know, when, you know, uh, Jeff, when we were, and I'm assuming it's the same way. It really doesn't matter, if, if, particularly if you went to school in the U.S. Anything involved in the screen was an elective, right? Yeah, so if true. You, if you wanted to do be a photographer, if you wanted to be a videographer, you know, that was a little thing that you did over there on the side. You know, it wasn't a main part of your ELA, your math, your science, mm -hmm. right? It was like a, you know, uh, yeah. a coutumant. Elective. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's an elective kind of thing. Little did we know that in 2007, a device called the iPhone would come around and at the same time, the internet would happen. And at the same time, all of these, you know, Intel and all of these uh, graphics folks would create these chips that could create a world where we communicated through the screen um, as our primary way of communication, not just how we access information, but how we interact with information, how we interact with people. We had no yeah. idea that the screen would be our main way of communicating. So fast forward to now, um, that is all of our uh, media literacy programs are based in the screen language world. And cool. how, so we don't teach media literacy from the standpoint of how to use a camera, or how to use, a, mm. how to edit, no, we teach you from the standpoint of how to communicate a message using this language, because this is the language of now and the language of the future. And if you don't understand how we're using screens to communicate messages, then you're not literate in today's society. Understanding how screens communicate messages to us and then how we can use that power to communicate messages to others is literally the literacy of now. And so um, all of our programs are based in that world, whether they're K through 12 programs, elementary programs, uh, college level programs. We do a lot of community workshops where we travel to communities and, you know, we go. The first thing we say is, OK, this is not learning how to operate a camera or to edit. This is learning yeah. a new language using these devices. Yeah. 
And so how do you communicate a, a message using these devices and learning this language? And so mm -hmm. that's where our connection is to media literacy and kind of how we see language. And I got to thank my experience at, at Jacob Burns Film Center. Uh, I can't even remember the executive director that I, I mean, him and his program and director. I must have been on the phone with them every day after we left. <laughs> I just it was like, you got to tell me more about your approach and how did you come to this? And how did you break? I mean, the, the work that they were doing was just fascinating to me. And uh, so I took that and built upon that, took it back to the Nickelodeon Theater, and, and then it eventually became part of the work that I do and the work we do here at OTR. Awesome. Can you maybe just give an example of like, what's a lesson that you find that is really popular or uh, an idea that seems to be really resonating either with educators or with students uh, when you kind of talk about this idea of this, of screen language? Which I love that. I love that term. That right there is what resonates the most. Yeah. When we come into a room and say, well, we're teaching you a language. Ooh, I and love people that. all of a sudden go, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing they always do. And it completely changes how they mm. think about what they're going to do with the camera and what they're mm. going to do with an edit. Because throughout the process, uh, regardless of what age level, and, 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 and to be honest with you, Jeff, it doesn't matter what we're teaching. Every right. single form of media literacy education that we teach has that at the center of it. So even if we're doing that. a community workshop, even if we're speaking to teachers or we're doing professional development with teachers in South Carolina or we're working with the Boys and Girls Club, doesn't matter. That's at the center of it. Um, uh, and so that as soon as we say that, as soon as we uh, introduce folks to the concept of learning a language and learning how to understand how to read that language, mm. then understanding how to write in that language, it completely changes people's perspective on how they interact with their, these devices. You know, their phones, oh, with Facebook, with social media, with in any device, you know, with your flat screen TV while you're sitting on the couch. Now you're thinking about what, how these things that, like I said before, these approaches that were reserved for photographers and directors and sure. those folks, how now we have to use that approach to be able to understand how to dissect information and how it's been given mm -hmm. to us through a screen. Because ultimately, Jeff, and I know I'm starting to ramble here a little bit, but I'm really, really passionate about this area of our work. Ultimately, if you don't understand how to communicate using screen language, if you don't understand that you're missing the entire boat when it comes to technology. And this is what I impress upon schools all the time. Schools love to put a device in kids' hands, right? Here's yes. a tablet, here's a laptop, here's a device. Yep. And I yep. always tell schools, just because you can use a hammer and a nail to nail or hang a picture on a wall, doesn't mean you can build a house. Yeah. What the difference is understanding the process. Mm. It's what are you, what ultimately are you trying to communicate? That allows you to look at the device completely different because now it's not about use. It's about understanding. And that mm. is where education lives, is our ability to help people understand so we can adapt to this society in a way that, that, that can allow us to function. I, I was just on a, having another conversation with a buddy of mine the other day, you know, Human society right now, we don't have a choice. They're not giving us a choice. Everyone is forcing us into the device world, right? Even if you go to like a bar nowadays or you go to yep. a sports game, they're going to say, we don't take cash. You know, <laughs> yeah, <it's so> true. <laughs> you got to use your it's phone true. or your device or your watch and put it on the screen and boop, you can buy something. And so we're being forced into this world. Unfortunately, yeah. we're not being taught the skills to adapt to this world. So we're just kind of mm. going along and hoping that everything works out okay. And, and it's the first time human society has been in this place at every other inflection point of adaptability, there was something that came along and said, okay, let, here, let's uh, teach you how to catch up with the printing press. Let's teach yeah. you how to catch up with, you know, uh, you can actually access books on your own now, instead of having to yeah. go to uh, uh, having one person tell you what's in a book or, you know, even when it came to tools, even when it came to cars, right? This is how you drive. This is this is a stoplight. And it's not like we had to adapt. This is the first time in human history where there's the adaptability. I mean, it's, we're so far behind. It's not even. <laughs> I agree. And we just yeah. assumed, right? I we think one assumed. of the problems. 
Well, the problem was, is, and we still do this, and I yeah. 100% agree with you. We just assume that kids know, yeah. especially students, right? Kids mm-hmm. just know, like, and I hear this all the time from our years. Well, they just know how to use it. I'm right. like, no, they don't. No, they, <laughs> no, they don't. No, they don't. They don't. And you know, they know how to use it in the same sense that we know how to hang a picture on a wall using a hammer and a yes, nail. Yes, exactly. Which means you would never trust that kid to build you a house. Never, no. ever in a million years. No. They know how to do this. And, you know, yeah. it's so fascinating to me, Jeff, that you said that because parents tell me all the time, oh, you know, they'll see me speak or something. They'll be like, oh, yeah. you know, my three-year-old, you know, she just takes the lab tablet. Yeah. That's because it's intuitive. That has nothing yeah. to do with her ability to understand That's right. technology. That's because you press it and swipe. I mean, yeah. if a three-year-old can't do that, then I don't know yeah. what to tell you. That's not fascinating. <laughs> you know I mean? It's so true. They make these apps really intuitive. They make yeah. them very easy so that very you know exactly easy. what to do to interact with them. But Absolutely. that doesn't actually mean – and this is – I love this. And I'd love to get into this a little bit. Now Please. you got me Now you got me pumped up. I love So it. here we go. Yeah. You know, one of the things I, I love, and I'd love to hear your take on this, is sure. I when I'm doing parent conversations and even talking with educators, mm-hmm. one of the things that we're always talking about, I love this idea of screen language. Like I just want to keep repeating that so listeners – kind of start wrapping their head around, sure. okay, I'm driving to school today. Where am I teaching this idea that the screen is a language? Yep. And to your point, on a laptop, on a phone, doesn't matter where the device is, right? Nope. You are interacting with the screen. That's right. And one of the things that I'm talking about all the time is, with, especially with students, is the amount of information that they see that the adults in their life don't. Mm-hmm. You know, it was one thing to go back and say, oh, we all sit down and we're all watching, you know, a movie on TV or we're all watching. And I usually use NFL on on Sundays because most sure. people do in America. I know I do. We all are watching that experience together. Right. And we're all watching an experience. And so when an ad comes on the screen, I, as a parent, can have a conversation if it's appropriate, have a conversation with kids saying, why is this there? What did you see? What do you notice? Mm-hmm. The problem is in our smaller screens like phones you're not seeing those same conversations, Mm. right? When a kid is swiping through Instagram, the ads that that child is seeing are specific to that child. And if they don't have the language, if they don't understand what story is being told to me, what is happening here? What does it take to make that? I see the same thing happening now. You know, TikTok with this generation is all the rage and kids want to become TikTok influencers or they believe these TikTok influencers more than they believe the parents and adults in their lives. Yes. And understanding that there's a language that is being spoken to them that is this storytelling language to go back to, you know, what OTR is, right? This, yeah. There's a language being told to you. And if you don't understand that, you're in a you're you're not going to be able to comprehend that you're being sold something. I, I would even push that further. You're not you're not going to be able to function in the world mm. that we live today. Not not at a level that is healthy for you or your family. Ooh. I would even push that further. And, 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 and the reason why I push that further is because, again, we're being forced to live in a screen world. You, you, you didn't ask <laughs> for an Apple yeah. Watch. You didn't ask for there to be a screen at the gas station or when you're in the hotel and there's a screen in the mirror in the bathroom. Like you didn't so ask true. for those things. They just we're just being pushed in that direction. And so what what we've done for whatever reason when it comes to education is we've just kind of trucked along, you know, despite all these changes yeah. and we've treated it, we treated screens like we treat the radio. If mm. that makes sense, you know, or TV, you know, you push a button to turn it on, you push a button, to turn it off, you turn up the volume, turn down the volume, easy, yeah. right? But no, it's not, it's not easy when all of your information is coming through this device. So going yeah. back to the TikTok or, or YouTube influencer example you use, so if the only information you're giving someone about how they can process information, you know, is based on either um, what you're hearing me say. Right. Mm -hmm. Or based on what you know from learning the printed language in school, subject verb Mm -hmm. agreement. Right. If you if you're only using those rules, I could tell you will believe whatever. Yeah. So true. Right. There's no limit to what you can believe, because at no point in either one of those lessons, when it comes to a screen, is someone asking you to ask yourself, why are they telling me this information? Mm. What techniques are they using to tell me this information? What 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 are they trying to tell me? 
And is it even good for me? Like there's some basic rules of media literacy, you know, who is sharing this information? Why are they sharing this information? What are they trying to say? All of those rules are baked in the media literacy education. Like they're literally like the core rules. Yeah. And so they're not, but those are not the rules of uh, written language. Yeah. So if you don't understand that part, you can't function like you're just functioning blind. So it shouldn't yeah. really surprise people that we're like in the, I call it for context, I always call it, we're in the second big phase of fake news. This isn't the, the yeah. first one. The first right. one was when the printing press was ubiquitous, right? And you could just right. print Jeff it, whatever was you born wanted. by yeah. wolves. And then you read it yeah. and you go, oh my goodness, you know, Jeff had two wolf parents. Like that's, <laughs> we went through this before. This is yeah. the second iteration of it is, is for me more serious because there's so much information. Yeah. You know, back then, you know, you have to pick up a tract and you have to read that tract. Now yeah. you can read hundreds of tracks. Like you just scroll and there's track, track, yeah. track, track. You know what I mean? And so going yeah. back to those kids, if they're getting, if they're consuming that much information all the time, every time they pick up their device, how are they able to process that, process that in a way that is beneficial for their ability to understand? Yeah, it's, I agree with that. And it, you know, one of the things that I always say, and I love this because it fits right into everything that you're doing. Yeah. But when I'm talking with kids and when I'm talking with students, is I always use the phrase, you know, the world belongs to those that create, not those that consume. That's right. And if you find yourself death scrolling through TikTok and not understanding, because what what you do when I say that. The world belongs to those that create that and not those that consume. When you learn how to create a really good TikTok or a really good Instagram reel or a short documentary or whatever it is, you start to look at that media through the lens as a creator. Yep. It's, it's very much like as a keynote, and I'm sure you do this as a presenter, right? Yeah. As a, I go to other keynotes. Not to listen to the keynote, but to be like, ooh, I like the way they did ah. this. I like the way these do that, <laughs> oh, right? It's that a, it's a, a way I'm going to write that down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Write Definitely. That down, Definitely. You know? it's, and that's when, you, when you're on the creation side, it doesn't matter what it is, but especially with our screens, getting kids on the creation side of here's how you set up a shot with your phone. Here's mm -hmm. how you make this, you know, jump from in a TikTok, you know, doing jump cuts and all of that stuff then you start to understand what is being done to you as a consumer yep. because you understand the creation. Piece. Yes. And that part right there, Jeff, you start to understand what's being done to you. I love that. That is as in, that, that is the most important because that's literally what happened. Ha what's happening now is this being yeah. done to us. I mean, we could try to frame it with other language to make it feel better. But the truth is we, we didn't ask for it. So then the question becomes, oh, well, how do we adapt to it? Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the thing that I think, you know, we have the slogan here, media literacy is self-defense. That's our, mm -hmm. one of our slogans. We have these t-shirts around that. Um, because if you're going to, to enter a place in a world where you're being bombarded with information through a screen, you have to understand how to defend yourself. It's the same thing that, uh, our teachers were trying to teach us when we learn context clues, when we're reading books and we're writing those essays and we're reading Huckleberry Finn. They're trying to teach us these context clues. You know, what what was the character trying to say? Why yeah. do you think they did this to their mom? Why were they dressed this way? What was the catalyst of the antagonist or the protagonist? Like these these are the questions that now we got to take from being electives and find a way for it to be in ELA and find a way for it to be in science mm -hmm. and find it because I can tell you right now, these kids are thinking they're learning science from TikTok. They're yeah. thinking they're learning ELA from TikTok or YouTube yeah. and there's no understanding. It's just someone mm -hmm. like you and I that's figured out how to be a creator yeah. and is using that power to their advantage when we all should be empowered yes. in that way. I agree. I so agree. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there's a teacher right now who's driving to school, listening to this and being like screen language on, oh, no, oh my gosh, that is a uh, media literacy is self-defense. Yeah. Yeah. I just like, that's so huge. Yeah. I that's like the quote. You're going to see that all <laughs> over our social media. Uh, that's so good. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank I, I love that. But if there's a teacher who's, you know, driving into school this morning, listening to this, where do they get started? Like what, 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 
I'm, I'm getting ready to start another day. <laughs> I'm coming into a group of, I don't know, middle schoolers. What, what, could, what can I do today? Do you have any ideas or recommendations or just? You know, that's, a, that's always a very, very complicated question. And it's mm-hmm. one that I'm always challenging media literacy advocate and educators around the country to have better solutions. You know, right now, mm-hmm. the best solution I can give you is, is folks like Nomly uh, that we're a member of and our company is a member of. It's the National Association of Media Literacy Educators and the work that they're doing. Go to their website. They have very basic tools you can use. And, and, and when I say basic, meaning, you know, you can literally just go print the six core concepts of media literacy mm-hmm. education. And those are things that you can apply to your lessons. And they have lessons on ways to apply that. However, at the same time, the reason why I'm not um, I'm not a huge that, that it doesn't excite me to give that mm-hmm. answer is because th- these I feel are things that our educators should be exposed to when they do PD mm. and professional development education on a regular basis with their school. This is something schools yeah. and school districts should be making sure that they're getting our educators a part of because the mm. truth is, Jeff, you know, like I know, teachers already have, they already have so many new things that are coming yeah. their way every six months at school is yeah. a new testing they're changing the name yeah. of this program we have that that yeah. we called it this last year we call it this now and so it's like yeah. asking them to go okay go to this website they're like Ugh. <laughs> you know yeah what you know yeah. what i mean and so I, I i'm an advocate for yes to educator if you're listening yes nominally i love them uh uh the director uh, michelle lumpkin there is awesome and the work that they're doing is awesome we're a huge advocate for everything that they do Um, And yes, that's a great resource for you. And at the same time, I also encourage students to press upon their districts because I just don't think teachers have the time. I'm a teacher advocate. Why aren't we learning more about media media literacy education? Why is not screen language a part of something I have access to when when I'm doing professional development in the summer? District, help us out, help teachers out, because I believe that's the role of the district is to, you know, uh, every year we're doing those assessments, districts are doing those assessments, right? They're figuring out what the test scores are, you know, how we need to, this needs to be a part of those conversations that districts should be on the forefront of, of coming to people like you, Jeff, or coming to OTR or Anomaly and saying, okay, how can we get our teachers more involved here so that um, they have another avenue that's accessible to them through their school pipeline, as mm. opposed to them feeling like they have to go out on their own to pull this into their lesson planning yeah. for their class. Yeah, students. and I think when you approach it that way, and one of the things that I do with schools is try to figure out, because you, to your point, teachers are trying to cover so much stuff. Yeah. You know, you take math just as an example. I think there's something like 215 standards you're supposed to cover in 180 days, right? Like man. just things that are just unbelievable right now oh, in education. Man. Science too. So, when I'm when I'm looking when I'm you know supporting schools and stuff, one of the things I'm constantly looking at is taking things like this around screen language and saying, okay, what does this replace that maybe we mm. do instead of doing something else? That's good, you know, you know. And so we look for places where we're having the same conversation we always needed to have noun verb agreement, but we're going to be looking at noun verb agreement through the lens of screen screens, right, or through Absolutely. the lens of right, or we're looking at persuasion through ads online or we're looking at lighting like in science right you're looking at lighting well let's look at lighting and how you light up a tiktok to get you that perfect (laughs) you know it literally is science i mean screen screen language is science you know uh human beings read well in in america we read from left to right yeah so if you understand screen language when you're looking at a screen creators know that because we all that are American are are uh, are read from left to right, the left side of the screen is always the safe part of the screen. Mm. The right part of the screen is always where we put attention. So whenever mm. you're watching any kind of movie or music video, any kind of narrative production, we use those skill, we use those things all the time, and it's that's a great. scientific human understanding of how the human brain works that science can apply. You yeah. know, uh, e- with ELA, the way that we teach. Um, uh, so our first building block when it comes to understanding screen language uh, on the media literacy level is the shot. You mm. know, understanding the concept of what is a wide shot, what is a medium shot, right? Those yeah. are just, that is the uh, essentially understanding words. So yeah. you go from shot to learning how to put shots in a sequence, or we always say, or a sentence. 
Yeah. Right. I love that. So that now now I've given ELA teachers a way to say, OK, we're going to look at noun verb agreement or yeah. we're going to look at subject verb agreement or we're going to look at uh, the, the how to put together a sentence and how to reword that sentence by using these clips. Let's, Ooh, I love let's that. switch these clips around. What does this say? Now that we understand why a shot means place and a close up means uh, uh, emotion. OK, now what does this sentence say? Right. That is ex- something that ELA teachers can do. And so, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that that. I'm glad you said it that way because that yeah. helped me understand a little bit clearer, you know, some of the some of the ways that that teachers can kind of say, oh, OK, there's a even if you're driving, listen to this is a way they can say, yeah. oh, OK, that's something I can. I know I know I know how to infuse that easily without talking to yeah. my principal. Yeah. And, there, and a lot of times I find just like what you're saying, right? A lot of times there's these, just these little tweaks. Mm-hmm. You just make a little tweak. Like we're still teaching the same standard. We're still covering the same stuff because we have to. Yep. But how do you bring screen language into that? Yes. Right. And yep. it's not, we don't need more standards. We don't need more stuff. We no. need to just tweak what we've already done yeah. and update it to a world that li- where we live in screens. Yes. And, and for better or for worse, we do. Yes. And it's, you know, we can't avoid it's been it. forced upon us. As we, you said. It's been forced so we upon just gotta us. Get there. I yeah. can tell you right now i mean a lot of people are gonna watch this through a screen or when yeah, they're done so with true. this when they get home at night they're watching the screen yeah know, <laughs> checking their screen first thing in the morning it is it's That's just so it's it's yeah, hot it's the world do. that we live in now and so yeah. we have to figure out how to adjust you yeah i love that mm-hmm. last question for you here uh for our audience of educators who may have aspiring filmmakers in their class mm-hmm. or i would even say believe they someday they want to be an influencer mm-hmm. How else do you think teachers today can encourage and support storytelling for tomorrow? That's a really good question. And and here's what I would say to that. I think one of the things that teachers can do to support the storytellers of tomorrow is take the barriers off of the things that students can create with the camera. Mm. So let me see if I can be more specific. A lot of times when teachers are telling me they're doing camera based assignments, um, it's so narrow. Um, you know, uh, let's make a story about this. Let's give you some clay, make a short animation about the clay thing, right? Uh, yeah. Turning the clay into a star or a dinosaur. But you're still trapped in this world um, where it's narrative based. Hmm. I would or I would say to a teacher, how can you make your assignment on any given day a product they could make a video out of? Hmm. That's how you train storytellers, you know, because the the truth is there isn't a subject you can't find a video on in the YouTube it's or so TikTok true. space. Right. <laughs> I mean, That's I don't true. care what it is. Not, yeah, it's, it's, it's not true. reduced to let's make a st- short animation that we make up and there's a story that has a beginning, middle and end. We can make a story of beginning, middle and end about anything. Yeah. About calculus, about where go where X goes and Y, about Pythagorean theorem, about a uh, 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 photosynthesis. You literally can make a video story about anything. So take it out of the world of just narrative and and give students more opportunities for them to say, how do you take this, whatever mm. we're whatever we're learning today. And how do you turn that into an actual video story? Let let that be that. the the process. And I think the more we do that, the more because like any uh, medium, filmmakers need practice. So the yeah. more you get opportunity to practice, the more you get opportunity to flex that muscle, the better you'll get at it. So that's what yeah. I that's one suggestion I would give. Yeah, and what I love is you know we I mean because we live in a world with so many screens, yeah. you don't have to have a great camera. No, you don't need to go buy thousand dollar high definition, (laughs) you know, I mean, especially by the time you're in middle school, high school, you at least have every, you know, every other kid has a cell phone. If not 98% of kids have a cell phone that have 4k cameras on them. these days. (laughs) They all have cameras. They all have ways of editing video. Yeah. There's so many free platforms. It doesn't make sense. You don't have to go get, I remember I was talking to this one group. They were like, which tablet? I was like, I'm all. I'm always an advocate of. I don't care. It doesn't matter. You know yeah. what I mean. I, I, whenever we're doing workshops and we have to like um, get an organization to buy equipment, I'm like, I'm like, let's go get the cheapest thing. Yeah. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm always a fan of understanding the basics. If they want to yeah. build from there, if they want to yeah. go up to a six hundred dollar camera or a thousand dollar editing software, fine. Yeah. But let's just start at a pencil and paper. Yeah. <laughs> so if they have a phone in their pocket. 
if if you know you all can buy some those fifty dollar twenty. I mean, now you can buy like a a flip camera off of Amazon for like twenty five bucks. Do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so you know, good. y'all got computers in the library. You know, yeah. uh, Microsoft has ClipChamp that's free that you can edit on. Do that, and then start there as opposed to um, thinking that there's that the tech the the cost barrier to this type of work is gone. Yeah, you I know, agree. I mean, I mean, most even podcast platforms are free. You know, you yeah. just literally go. You can go to YouTube right now, set up an account right now, and go live right now. <laughs> yeah, so true. It costs you absolutely nothing. It costs you nothing. Yeah. Yeah, costs you nothing. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you for spending time with me. This has been fantastic. Screen language. And media literacy is self-defense. The two things that I've got written down here uh, to follow up on. I, those are fantastic. I love that. If I people want to learn more about you, about OTR, where should they go over to? How do they connect with you? Easy. OTRMG.com is our website. Um, and it's the same on all of our platforms as OTRMG. I, I think our Twitter and Instagram and everything is at OTRMG or at OTR Media Group. Um, okay. It's really easy to find. Everything is the same branding and coloring, so we're really easy to find. Um, and it's Facebook the same way. And so OTR Media, everything is OTR Media Group or at OTRMG. Um, and so if you see that 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 red and yellow and blue, that's us. And awesome. um, yeah, we we, we 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 and I can't thank you enough, Jeff, for this opportunity. And I just want to encourage you to keep pushing educators to shift education. We have to get our students as well as our adults, because that's the other thing we didn't get a chance to talk yeah. about. We got to figure out adult education. We got to figure out how to get post college. Uh, yeah. grads and people that are, uh, uh, you know, that have already been through the K through 12 world. How do we get them adapted in this edu- in this society where we have to learn all the time? That's one of the parents communities. I, yeah. That's one of the things I love about the work you all are doing. It, it, uh, it advocates for a constant learning system, which is what we, what we push for. We believe education should be like a bicycle, not like a step, yeah. right? You should constantly that. be learning. And um, we got to challenge those things. So I appreciate the work that you all are doing in that space. And, and thank you for allowing me uh, the time to just run my mouth. I appreciate it, Jeff. <laughs> well, thank you, sure. I appreciate you being here. And we'll make sure there are links to everything in the show notes, wherever you happen to be listening to this podcast. So thank you, my friend, awesome. for uh, a great episode and, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.